Zero Foxtrot does not profess to share or promote the opinions and beliefs expressed by show host or guests. The Stay Zero podcast was created to provide a platform for servicemen and women to share their stories. Due to the nature of this podcast, sensitive topics will arise. Conversations about combat, PTSD, drug use, and other such subjects will occur. Viewer discretion is advised. Welcome back to the Stay Zero podcast. I have Jimmy Casera with me today. Uh, you're a fireman, correct, in the local area? Yeah, for Austin Fire Department. Yep. Nice. How long have you been with them? I've been with Austin Fire uh, right at just over 13 years. Um, prior to that, I was working at Cedar Park Fire Department uh, when I first got in the fire service. And then um, while working there, I applied at Austin probably six times. How'd that and go? Finally, you know, it's, a, it's, it's just a competitive process. Yeah. So I finally got on uh, in 2011. Yeah. And then, uh, like I said, I worked full-time in, in Cedar Park Fire, and then I worked part-time in Liberty Hill, and then I did some part-time work in Jollyville Fire. And then, which is very small. Were you just looking for a full time gig somewhere, and part time was all that was available, or no? Play, play so I worked field. I worked full time in Cedar Park. Okay, and um, you know, we work one day on two days off. So my off days, you know, I was always, you know, I had a wife and kids, so I was trying to make extra cash. You know, mm -hmm. so I always found these little part time jobs. Um, you know, I picked up a shift here and there, like I said, with Liberty Hill and Jollyville, um, just for extra money. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. Uh, but my full time at the time was Cedar Park, and then um, you know I, I've always applied at Austin since shit since two thousand one or since two thousand when I, when I first got out of the Marine Corps I, I literally walked up to the recruiting office on East Seventh Street, and it was APD and AFD, so I took apps for both and just started applying everywhere. You know, <laughs> so, people like firemen more than cops. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, I couldn't get on. I, I, APD is never. Uh, uh, I got, I got, I got disqualified from APD for drug use from high school. Oh yeah. So yeah. So I was like, all right, never mind. What'd you I'll do in the Marine Corps? I knew you were going to ask me that. <laughs> Gosh, dang it. Uh, it's funny because I'm going to get a lot for this. I was a mailman. I was a postal clerk in the Marine Really? Race. Oh yeah. That's nice. a job. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so. <laughs> what was that like? Uh, it was kind of lame. It was actually, it wasn't terrible. Um. Were you open contract when you? Went I in? did. Okay. I enlisted open. Yeah. Um. Because at the time, my recruiter don't was, do that. No. <laughs> One of my yeah. best friends did, and they made him a cook. Yeah. He didn't speak to me for like two years. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, dude, I don't care what your job is. I've known you since we were ten. Like, yeah. but I don't. I don't know. I still I remember it, my my recruiter, Sergeant Velasquez. He's like, oh, just go open. You'll get infantry. You'll, you know, that's, that's the that's same what you thing want. they told him. And I was like, heck yeah, let's do it. Because at the time. My dad was like, nah, don't, don't look at another service. My dad was a Marine, right? Mm -hmm. And he was like, go to another service to get more benefit, you know, different jobs, whatever. And at the time, I had a, a buddy that just, he just went to boot camp and um, uh, my buddy Joe and, and, uh, yeah, I wouldn't do anything, you know? And so I decided, you know, to join. And, and that's what he told me. He's like, oh, you'll get him, just go open. And I was like, sweet, let's do it. Yeah. And then, uh, you know, I go through boot camp and then I go to combat school and they start handing us our, like, where we're going next. And they start calling out everybody, everybody's MOS, right? And uh, I hear, the, I see the little troop handlers, like, what's this? What's this? And they're whispering to each other. And, and I knew they were talking about, about me. And they're like, 0161, what, like, what's that? And nobody knew what it was. And then this old staff sergeant comes up and they're like, what is it? Like they're like, oh, one six one. What is that? And he's like, oh, they go around picking up these mailboxes or deliver mail. And I was like, great. Like, how do I get out of this thing? You know. <laughs> yeah. And then you know, sent me home, did recruiter assistance for a month, and then I went to um, Fort Jackson, South Carolina, was where postal school was. And uh, the funny thing is, it's self paced, right? Okay. And uh, it was all branch school, and so we're with Air Force, Navy, Army. And uh, they're like, hey, the sooner you get done, the sooner you can pick where you want to go. And my buddy Joe had just got, he was in 29 Palms. And he's like, hey, when I'm done here, I'm going to Pendleton. So I was like, I'm going to hurry up and get done. And I want to go to Pendleton. And uh, so I'm trying to hurry up. And I'm some of the guys are like, how long have you guys been here? Like three months, four months, five months? I'm like, why? It took me literally six weeks. He's like, I'm out of here. <laughs> you know? They're just cruising. <laughs> oh, cruising. Yeah. 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 
because uh, there was really no supervision really that's you know? wild yeah it, it was uh, uh as, as structured and regimented as everything is with a schedule and with mm -hmm. a thing to have a, a study uh, that's i mean that's cool it was cool and then you know the fun part was like when i went when i got in fleet and i got to pendleton um it was cool it wasn't a bad job you know yeah. um you know a little kind of monotonous you deliver mail right sure. it's, it's routine routine yeah. and uh but i did go with the 13th mu i got i got picked to go on a deployment and I delivered mail on deployment and probably the best time I ever had. Yeah. You know, I was on ship going to, you know, travel. Where'd y'all where'd y'all go? Uh so we, you know, we left California, Hawaii, and then we stopped in um, you know, Singapore, Guam, Singapore, Thailand, and then, you know, did the the golf, you know, hung out there for a couple maybe a month and a half or so. And then on the way back we hit up like uh Australia, went to Darwin, Australia, Bali, Indonesia. And then come back and, you know, hit up um, uh, Singapore again and then back home. It was actually, I was awesome. Catching ping pong balls in oh, your solo Oh, yeah, well, yeah. And little darts on the table. I've, I've never been, but I've heard the stories. <laughs> I went back and forth to Iraq. That yeah. shithole. Yeah. yeah I've never was, been there. You know, see thank, the world. Thank God. Yeah. Nope. I, I, uh, I made it as far as Kuwait. And like I said, that was, that was the extent of my deployment and that well was it was an 90s. important role man. yeah <laughs> male over there especially that was our lifeline well and it's funny because you know, you know I, I joke about it and you know guys make fun of like hey you're a mailman the marines they have that i'm like yeah i said but it was uh uh almost like prison rules man on ship it's like at the time you know payroll and mail and cooks were like you made friends with them hell yeah and so when we get to port you know every time we got mail i made sure all the staff ncos and officers got their mail Right, mm -hmm. and then I made sure the cooks and the payroll got their mail first, and then I everybody else. And uh, so when we get to port, you know, everybody's waiting in line for to cash a check or to use the ATM. I just hey, I need some money. They're like, hey, come on in. So I go and get money, and I don't have to wait in line. You know. Oh yeah. Or like on ship, you know, coming back drunk as shit from Thailand, and you know, I was I was an E three, so I couldn't stay overnight, and you know, drunk and hungry, like go to the cooks. Hey, can you make me a burger? Yeah, I got you. Come on in. You know. And so it was like. Kind of prison rules. Yeah. <laughs> so, Not a bad friend to have. No, no. So, Absolutely. Um, but yeah, it was, you know, it was a good time. Uh, I did my, you know, I just did my four years and, and got out. So, yeah. Talk so. to me about, about the accident or I guess the uh, fire. What happened that day? Where was this? And, and tell me about that. Yeah. So, um, back in 2015, you know, at the time, at the time, you know, Austin, like, uh, I was working at Station 18, uh, one of the busiest houses in the city. I was far for just tailboard, you know, and, um, you know, we worked overtime. Like, that's how I started making extra money working overtime. And um, and so I picked up a shift of overtime, and I got sent to Station 31 over off of uh, 2022. And uh, me and my buddy were there. Uh, we worked together at 18s, uh, Jeremy. It was a normal shift, man. You know, uh, I didn't know anybody there, you know, because, you know, there's 50, now 53 stations in Austin. Maybe wow. I think 54 now, I'd lose count. Um, and uh, so I didn't really know anybody except for Jeremy and maybe one other pe person there. And <clears throat> so it's a, you know, a normal shift. You get to just talking and introducing each other and, and kind of hanging out. And um, we did a little bit of training, you know, worked out, hung out, had dinner. Uh, one of the guys uh, had his family come over and, uh, you know, we all pitched in for dinner, you know, it was normal kind of firehouse stuff, you know. And, uh, you know, it was a good shift. We weren't, you no, know, not terribly busy. You know, I think we made six or seven runs during the day. And, uh, uh, you know, I go to bed that night and, uh, you know, tones go off at seven o'clock in the morning. I get box alarm tone. When does y'all shift change? We shift, we shift change at noon. Oh. So we do noon to noon. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, um, so 7 a.m. tones go off. And uh, jump in the rig and, you know, you kind of get, you know, uh, I hate to say complacent, but it's like, oh, it's probably nothing, right? We get a lot of box arm tones and a lot of it's, a lot of time it's really nothing really going on. Um, so I'm getting the rig and, and kind of slowly, you know, getting dressed, you know, getting, make sure I get everything buttoned up. And then um, on the way to the fire, we hear it gets upgraded, you know, and, or that there's heavy fire and whatever. So I button up, you know, get dressed, you know, get my air pack on, kind of get ready to do some work. And uh, when we pull into the parking lot, they upgraded to a second alarm. And I was like, oh, like it's, it's ripping, it's going. Yeah. 
And it was over off uh, uh, Dry Creek Drive in 2022. And uh, not, you know, wasn't a territory that I was familiar with. Like I said, I was, uh, and that's the unique thing about Austin, man. Like you pick up overtime, you go anywhere in the city. You know, you, you hopefully stay at your home station or your home battalion. Mm-hmm. But sometimes, you know, if you work north, you can end up way south Austin. So, you you know, you don't know anybody. that over a thousand firefighters in the city, you know? Wow. And so I went to territory I was real familiar with. And, uh, um, you know, so we pull up on scene and... and, and uh, What's the structure? So the structure is a two-story apartment complex, right? Like okay. just a couple of buildings, right? And um, so we pull up and, uh, you know, I hear the radio traffic that was upgraded and possible victims. And, um, you know, the way we kind of operate, you know, from the academy... Everybody has like a role, right? And so, so that you can go somewhere and not know anybody, but you know the your different position. roles, your position, yeah. you know your role, right? And that's kind of how the training aspect of it is like this is, and then we have pre assignments, right? So, first engine is going to do this, first truck's going to do this. So, you kind of have a, an idea of what is expected when you get on scene, depending on your time of arrival or, you know, our order of arrival, right? And then what role you're playing you know, in the back as, as tailboard or the officer, or the driver, like, you know, your little roles. Right. Um, so we pull up on scene and, uh, you know, it's heavy fire. Like I said, two story apartment complex fires are right through the roof. Um, fire blowing out of a window, uh, the, a door window, two windows of fire coming out, uh, heavy, a lot of fire, heavy fire. And, uh, uh, we were the second in engine Right. So there was a truck that was on scene first. Originally came out like an electrical fire. So it was dispatch was just like a, a smoke investigation. So I think it was uh, uh Quint nineteen was is is a ladder, a truck, uh pulled up and um they upgraded it. And so we were the second arriving engine. So our role essentially in the way it plays out is we were backup. The first engine it would be considered fire attack. Like they're first on, they're the first engine, hose company go fight the fire, right? Yep. And so we're the second in engine and our role in that pre-assignment is the backup. We're going to back them up, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but when I get there, um, you know, everybody's kind of doing their thing and 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 I got started to kind of get in the habit of, of slowing down. You know, early on in my career, the balls of the wall, bust through the door and not, not, you know, organized, just, oh, let's go balls and break shit, put fire out and, you know, high five after, right? And uh, so after a while, I started getting to where I was, you know, starting to slow down, as slow as fast, right? And uh, I would stop and take a, a mental picture of what's going on. Like, what do I got? Where, what am I? What do I need to do kind of thing? And so I did that. I jumped off and I looked. And again, I see fire through the roof. I see fire blowing out this door here. You know, uh, what we would call the, the A side, like facing the trucks, right? Um, you know, fire blowing out the uh, the door, the windows. And... Um, I grab a, a hose bundle, right? It's kind of like apartment load, right? Um, and so I start flaking it out and I see um, the truck had taken a line up and, uh, but no one's flowing water, right? Heavy, heavy fire. And the first and engine company started doing um, VIS where they were going and, and pretty much going to break a window, search the room, get out. Cause that was the only real access to see cause there was a report of a victim. Well, they, they were doing that and they got called off and I finally, you know, I deployed my, my hose line bottom of the stairs and I'm still just kind of sitting there waiting on water. Like I'm not getting water yet. Like the, the other person I'm with and that's kind of the role, right? I was on the nozzle. The other guy's kind of going to hook my hose up and get me some water and the officer's doing his thing. And, uh, so get to the bottom of the stairs, I look up and, uh, shit ton of fire. And again, this is already minutes into the incident and no one's really putting water on this thing. Right. And, and like I said, we're that second in and the priority at the time was, you know, Hey, there's a victim. Let's find, find them. But we also need to get water. Right. And so, uh, go upstairs and I open up, start put, knocking down fire at the, you know, walking up to the landing, you know, on the second story. And I start knocking down fire and I get an initial knockdown. And when I did that, I see on the backside, like, Half the wall's already gone. I can see the trees in the back, like through the apartment, you know. I can see the sky, roof is gone. Um, so the survivability was very low if someone was in there, right? Yeah. And um, 
risk a little to save a little risk a lot to save risk, a lot yeah right? exactly yeah. right and so <clears throat> do a knockdown initially and uh um you know the the other company that was doing the vis they had broken windows so it's starting to vent obviously you know change the environment so fire is venting and there's fire like literally blowing out of this hallway it was a lot of fire it was fire this way to the apartment to my left and i could see in the attic there was fire and then looking down this was like the last so the doors like in front of me, right? And there's a, a apartment to the left of me, which was the last apartment in that building. But then the rest of the apartments went to my right, you know, about four or five apartment buildings, like connected, right? Mm -hmm. And so I see there's fire in the attic space. I step in and there's fire in the attic space and just a ton of fire. I mean, I still remember the uh, a microwave, a square microwave above the stove was, was a flaming square, you know? And uh, just a shit ton of fire. And I'm um, doing my best to try to knock it down. And you have water at this point. I have water at this point, right? And so I'm knocking it down. And then um, uh, we lose water at one point and kind of stay by the door. And then we get the pressure back up. What was happening? There was kind of switching lines around and 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 someone tapping a hydrant somewhere. All that, back. yeah, all the water supply stuff, yeah. And so um, uh, I finally get water back, and I'm fighting fire. And, and the hose line I was on was pretty hot. Like I'm a big dude, and um, it was hard to handle. I mean, it was over, I was over pumped and I was having a hard time handling the line. So I shut it down and the officer I was with, I was like, here, Hey, like here, you take it. I'm trying to get some more hose. So I pull some more hose and he, he opens it up and starts fighting fire. I mean, there's a lot of fire and he starts knocking it down. He's a big guy, kind of just about my size, you know, maybe a little taller. And, um, he starts knocking down, you know, trying to get some of that fire knocked down. And, uh, um, I'm standing kind of by the front door, maybe four or five feet in on a on a on a brick hearth. You know, is it a hearth, right? Is that what's called? Yeah. And uh, what is the bottom part of a fireplace called? What is it called? I think I it's think, a hearth, I right? Think, yeah. yeah, yeah. So I'm kind of right. standing on that, and there's a brick wall fireplace to, that I'm standing on, and, and it was like a gas fireplace, right? And uh, he shuts down, and because it was over pump, he was leaning forward, kind of like how I was, and he shut it down, and it threw him back. And of course, there's debris all over the ground. There's, you know, roof on the ground. And he stumbles and smacks into the um, the brick wall, right? And I've had ceiling fall on me before at a fire. Kind of did one of these, kind of some ceiling fell, a brick, couple bricks fell, but didn't really think anything of it at the time. And uh, all of a sudden, my feet were just like, my feet were gone. And I feel myself go down. And I feel like like a stumble, like crash, crash, crash. And I was like, oh, shit, like. Something fell on me, but I'm still on the second floor. I'm going to put my hands up and someone's going to pick me up, right? Or help me up. And so I feel that and I was like, oh, shit. And I'm trying to wiggle, but I really can't move. And then at that same time, just another crash, like just like I felt my whole body just drop. And then um, just the extreme weight of like, you know, at the time I didn't know what it was, but it was that brick fireplace kind of fell over on top. And uh, what's I, the visibility like? Uh, clear. It was like Hollywood fire because the the roof was gone. It's vented. You know, okay. it's vented. So it was just fire everywhere, okay. right? And uh, um, but when I lost, you know, when, when I felt myself go down, I uh, uh, again, like I said, I didn't think anything of it. Still thought I was on the second floor, kind of no big deal. And then I felt this final like crash, and then just wait. And you know how like you ever did like uh, like working with rocks or bricks and you, the clinging sounds that it kind of makes when someone dumps a, a some brick or whatever. I kept hearing that like cling, 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 cling. And then it just kept getting heavy and heavy and heavy. And I felt the weight. And I still thought like, oh man, like I'm gonna put my hands up and someone's gonna help me up. And didn't think anything of it. And then I heard a mayday go out and it was the officer that I was with. So essentially I'm by the door and when the floor collapsed, right? Uh, I went down and in and the other two guys, uh, another the other tubboard had came up. I don't remember at the time, and they went down and rolled out the back patio door. So they kind of were able to self extricate, right? Yeah. And so I went when I went in. I went into the first floor uh, apartment that I was at, but I rolled kind of in a little mm -hmm. bit. And uh, was that floor on fire yet? The floor was not. That first floor was not. Everything was all on the second floor, right? And uh, um. And so I felt all that, right? And uh, and I still thought like, oh man, I'm just gonna, someone's gonna help me up, right? And I'll be like, I'm fine. And then uh, I heard this mayday go out and I was like, well, something's, something's, something's going on, right? And I still hadn't really panicked or thought 
Did whole, you realize it was for you? No, it was. So it was the officer did his own his own mayday oh, okay. that he needed help. He hurt his back, I think, and some other injuries. And I don't want to you know speak for him, but um, he I heard that mayday go out, and uh, so then that really kind of set in my panic, right? And then um, it got hot, like it just started to get really hot and bright orange, like all around me, and uh, and I start feeling the heat, and then I start really really panicking and uh because like my legs are starting to get real hot i feel my feet get hot my neck is the back of my neck is getting real hot ears are starting to get real hot and so I, i'm trying to move but i can't move right and i feel the heat just increase 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 and then i feel my my lower legs you know really burning and i'm trying to to move and i can't move like i'm stuck right and I'm, this weight of these you know what I know now was the 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 bricks and you know the part of the building material, you know, and uh, really struggling to move, and I I can't move, and it just gets hotter and hotter and hotter and bright orange. Well, then I finally feel like coolness. I feel wet on my neck, like I'm cooling off. It's no longer bright orange, and so then again, I'm hearing still radio traffic. I hear you know firefighter Caceres is missing and. Um, you know, everybody back out of the structure. I hear the three horn blast for everybody to back out. And then that's when I really started to, to panic, right? I'm like, I'm I'm still here, motherfuckers. Like, come get me. Are and, you talking on the radio? No, at I'm all? Not, no. The only thing I was able to get out, so I I, you know, I was smushed down and I was able to like wiggle my arms free. And of course, you know, I, I Are you set, on your back? I'm on my I'm up like a V shape. Okay. Like uh on my back, my legs kind of like like a v shape right? okay and uh so I'm laying on my back and really trying to figure out like how you know how to get out what I need to do whatever and not so when I started to feel the coolness and went it went dark it was completely dark and then I started thinking you know and that's one of the things what I bring up when I talk to cadets is like I reverted back to training right uh my first thought was how much air do I have mm -hmm. right and uh right when I said that my vibe, vibe alert, my vibration alert went off of my mask, right? Mm. Um, when you get low air on a, on a air pack, it vibrates and it makes a noise. You know. What is the PSI level? Do you remember? Uh, we're, our bottles are, are 4,500 PSI, okay. right? Uh, and they're, for that they're alarm, rated about it's a, below 1,000? Is... Below 1,000, yeah. 1,500, I think it is. And it's an early warning to let you know you have- You're running out of air. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so, so I feel my vibe alert going off. Mm. And then of course I start to panic, like, damn, like I'm running, like I'm gonna run out of air. And um, I start trying to trying to control my breathing, but it's I'm I'm breathing 100 miles an hour, right? And uh, I feel I start to feel my face mask being sucked down to my face because there's a seal around your face, so it's positive pressure air. And I I felt my face mask sucking down on my face, and uh, I'll let me back up. But prior to that, I was able when I got my hands free, I was able to grab my radio, my radio, my collar mic. And I was able to, I screamed mayday. I thought I said more, but all I got out was a mayday. I got to scream, mayday, mayday, mayday. And uh, so that's what was transmitted out, right? Uh, I didn't do the whole, like, this is who I am. I'm lost. You know, I have so many pounds of air. Like, I didn't give a an update, like, you know, training, you know, wants you to uh, to do to, to help find you, right? Sure. Uh, straight up panic mode. And uh, um, so I started thinking, like, Man, what do I gotta do to get out of here, right? Air. How much air do I have? And of course, I said my vibe alert went off. My face mask started sucking down to my face, and uh, still couldn't move. Trying to wiggle my feet and my legs, trying to get get free. And uh, um, again, reverting back to training. Right when I first did my first fire academy, um, we had the the old school like MSA mask with a a, a rubber hose coming down like it was called elephant trunk, right? And you, you screwed it in to the side of a regulator that was connected to a steel bottle and that's how you breathe. You had this elephant trunk, big rubber hose, right? And uh, and I remember in tr training, doing my first fire academy, um, when we would run out of air, cause uh, I did my, actually through ACC, I did my fire academy. Um, but at the time it was in Taylor. And so not a whole lot of money, you know, we didn't have the, all the up-to-date equipment, but we still had stuff that worked, right? So we had this old elephant trunk air packs, right? And so when we would run out of air, because uh, we didn't have a huge supply of uh, spare bottles in training, 
uh, we would take that elephant trunk and, and shove it down our coat because we still had air. Some in type here. of filter. Some type of filtered air, yeah. right? So we could still breathe <laughs> and still work. And so that thought came to my mind, like I'm running out of air and I was, I was able to finally, you know, move my hands and stuff. And uh, so when I felt that mass, you know, squeezing on my face, sucking down on my face, I was like, all right, like, I'm not going to suffocate. Like, I'm, I'm not, like, that's a shitty way to die. Like, I'm going to die, but I'm not going to fucking suffocate. Did you like, think that you were going to die? I thought I was going to die. Like, I accepted it. Like, all right. Like, I gave up, essentially. Like, really? oh, this is it, right? What was that moment like? Uh, Honestly, man, when I think about it now, it's like a, um, I feel like I quit. Like, I'm not a quitter. I don't give up. And uh, at that moment, like, I think that's what bothers me the most sometimes is uh, like, I fucking quit. Like I don't quit, you know? And, uh, <clears throat> and so I think that's like that moment, like I said, I, I, I'm just, I quit and I gave up. And so I was like, all right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna lift my mask up and I'm probably gonna, I'm gonna breathe in some air and I'm either gonna suck in all this toxic air and, and die, or I'm gonna have really fucked up lungs, uh, and, but I'm still gonna be all right kind of thing, right? And so I lifted my mask up and I took my hood and I, pulled my hood over my nose like this and then put my mask back down because my thought was I still have this filtered air in here, right? Through my coat. I always, that's how, you know, fire gear works. It you know, traps air kind of mm -hmm. thing. And so that was my thought was I still have this filtered air. I'll still be able to breathe, right? Because that's what I learned in my first academy with my elephant trunk. And so I reverted back to that and I was like, okay, I did it. You know, did it real quick kind of thing. And uh, I felt like I had this you know, a little lifeline. So what was that first breath like? Did you, is it? Uh, it was pretty bad. It was nasty. I tasted all the, everything, yeah. you know, um, you know, I was coughing. Um, thankfully I didn't have any real, like real damage, no searing because of the heat or yeah. anything. Just, just pretty much taking a puff of bad smoke essentially. Right. And so, um, you know, I'm still thinking like, what do I got to do to get here? What, what, you know, what do I got to do? And so, at the same time, I see a, a little flashy light bouncing, right? And I kind of still thought my orientation wise, I still thought I was on the second floor by the front door. Mm -hmm. And so I knew in my mind, my orientation, I was the front doors to my right. Like I, I never lost that thought. Like I knew I, I needed to go that way and uh, to my right. And so I see this flashy light coming in and it's a helmet light. And I look over and I see a big 16 um with a helmet light and it was uh the lieutenant on on the engine 16 that saw the collapse heard it and kind of did his own thing and ran in and was like somebody's in there right and there was another guy oscar that was tyler that did that and oscar um same they oscar saw it happen ran the toll command like hey there was there's a collapse there's somebody in there and him and Tyler come in and I see, like I said, the helmet with the 16, cause he was a, a lieutenant on, on engine 16 at the time. And uh, <clears throat> I remember physically reaching and grabbing him and curling him to me. I felt like I did, maybe I didn't, but I felt like I did. And I curled him to me and I said, I need some fucking air. I need air now, right? And um, uh, you know, he's, I heard him, you know, talking whatever and then i feel somebody come to my come across me and you know i have somebody on my left and i have tyler here well then he's sitting on top of me and he's got a i see because his flashlight i got a little bit of light and he's sitting on top of me and i see he's got a regulator in his hand and i'm trying to fight him for it like i want it so i can get some air yeah you know and finally we're fighting for it and i put my hands back and he swapped it out and um, it's funny because, you know, talking to him, he he said the same thing. He goes, I went back to training on our regulators. There's a little red bypass valve. And we used to say, you know, put the cherry on top, cherry on top and turn and locks it in. Right. And he said he thought back to that part of his training where he was like, cherry on top, put the cherry on top. And so um, he swapped it out and I've heard it. And I, then I took a breath and I was like, okay, I have air. And then of course, going back to training, I was like, I have an alternative air source. I don't need my air pack anymore. 
And so I took my air pack off and I sat up and I was able to move because my air pack was stuck. But mm. I didn't, you know, I didn't remove it at the time because I was that was my lifeline. Yeah. You know what I mean? And so I was able to sit up and move and I still thought or, you know, still trying to get out, like I want to go that way. And and Tyler and Oscar were trying to lift everything off me and try, you know, trying to move stuff. And I remember saying, like, hey, you need a halligan or a pry bar. Something to get this off me, like, you know, kind of helping, trying to help. Your legs are still pinned. My legs are still pinned from my waist down. Wow. And uh, so finally, you know, I, I'll, at the same time, I'm trying to yank my legs out. Like, I'm violently, like, yanking my legs out. And uh, at one point, I I did that and I was free. I was like, oh, shit. And I until, until this day, I feel bad. Like, I got free and I smushed Tyler and I crawled over him and I bolted to the door, right? And uh, I'm crawling, and then I start feeling. Y'all are connected at his at his uh, SCBA. No, group, right? no. So what had happened was um, he's hollering for air, right? And uh, there was another person, another firefighter outside who took his pack off and threw his pack in. Oh wow! Right, because okay. it had air regulator. We all have the same same equipment, and so that's what he used. He used that extra air pack. Wow! And swapped my regulator, so I was breathing. You had your own bottle. Had my own, had my own bottle. Wow, right? okay. And so, like I said, I smushed him down, crawled out, and um, I remember, like, uh, like people grabbing me, trying to pick me up, and they were choking me, and I was getting pissed off because I was trying to crawl out. And, uh, and I saw a bunch of feet, and I saw a backboard, and um, I stood up, and uh, that the air pack, I didn't know it was an air pack at the time, you know, like it was pulling my face down. So I yanked my face piece off, threw my helmet, threw everything, threw my gloves off. And I remember walking downstairs, right? And I still thought I was on the second floor the whole time, you know? The stairs I walked down was two little stairs from the first floor apartment that has two little steps, you know? <laughs> yeah. But uh, I literally thought I was still on the second floor. And I start walking. I don't even know where I was going. I was, I was pissed off. I was, I was, hurting you know uh i kind of didn't really know where i was or you know what had happened technically so i started walking over to the right and i was just walking like i just wanted to kind of gather myself and then uh one of the chiefs um he's a retired chief now mike frick um uh, best guy good guy he uh he grabs me he was like hey we're gonna go this way like come on and i remember stopping and uh, like taking a breath and i you know put my hands on my knees and trying to gather like like what just fucking happened yeah you know and uh and right when i thought it was funny thing is right when i thought that i took a breath and i like kind of like okay like i'm i'm okay right the uh man the worst pain ever man excruciating pain like it's like someone took a hammer right and started beating my foot with it over and over. every time my heart would my heart would beat mm. just like boom 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 and kind of like the cartoons with the big swollen toe, you know? Yeah, I mean? throbbing. Uh, yeah, throbbing. Uh, terrible pain. And uh, uh, he walked me over to the ambulance. And uh, um, it was a funny thing. We just did a training CE on how to remove gear from a burn firefighter, like how to safely do it, you know, yeah. so you don't damage. How do you do that? Uh, we cut them. That was kind of thing. Cut them off, kind of peel it off. Okay. Well- I walked over there and I just yanked my pants off and took my sock off because I wanted to see, you know, like where the pain was coming from. So I yanked my sock off and they're like, slow down, slow down, you know, like, you know, don't like, don't do that. And I took my sock off and I saw like my foot was just like, it was like you took a meat patty and dropped it on my top of my foot. And I can see like meat and my tendons from my big toe and, you know, just the big bubble, like skin flap and severe burn, severe burn. And then, um, I didn't realize that my leg was burned a whole lot. The pain was my foot, you know. And of course, you know, at the, at the time it was uh, Brackenridge. You know, they took us to Brackenridge. And uh, when I got to Brack, uh, the doctor there was like, hey, you're not staying. You're going to Bamsey. We're going to send you to Bamsey. So, loaded up. Um, you know, they doped me up pretty good. A funny, funny story. I'm in the back of the ambulance. And uh, at the time, I was teaching at ACC on the fire academy and on the EMT side, on the EMT classes. And I look up and there's a paramedic and one of my students from the EMT class is in there. Wow. And I said, hey, man, like, it's cool. Don't worry about it. Like, this doesn't happen every day. Just kind of pay attention, right? Still trying to give back, you know? Yeah. 
and it, his eyes, he was just like, like completely in shock. And uh, the funny thing is the medic goes, uh, how much do you weigh? And I was like, 280. And he was like, man, I'm going to fuck you up. I said, I don't care. Just don't make me throw up. And he's like, all right, I'm going to fuck you up. Slams a bunch of drugs. And then uh, he's like, how's that feel? And I was like, just don't let me throw. I don't want to throw up. I hate throwing up. Yeah, I do too. I'm not, and, uh, I'll be sick for an hour to yeah, avoid yeah. throwing up. Yeah. <laughs> and so uh, he said again, he's like, how much do you weigh? I was like, 280. He's like, all right, I'm going to fuck you up. And he slams a bunch of meds. And I'm just like, don't let me throw up, man. I don't want to throw up. <laughs> so uh, so anyway, I get to Brack and uh, you know, they send me to Bamsi. And I get to Bamsi and the doc there, amazing lady. She's a... a uh, I think maybe now she's a lieutenant colonel, colonel, but she was a trauma surgeon, you know, and she did a lot of deployments, Syria, Afghanistan, everywhere. She was, you know, she goes field hospitals and, you know, flight surgeon, all this stuff. And uh, she was like, hey, are you going to go to surgery? Like, we got to get this, your leg cleaned up, whatever. And I went to surgery and I woke up, I guess the next day or maybe day and a half. I don't remember exactly the time frame. And, uh, <clears throat> You know, my wife and kid there, and uh, I was in recovery and had a buddy there. And um, uh, I get all, hey, what happened? What happened? I was like, man, like, I was word vomit, like, trying to tell, like, just talk about it, talk it out, you know? Yeah. And uh, I was in Bam, I was there at Bamsi the first time, uh, maybe two and a half weeks or so, maybe three weeks, right? And they're like, hey, you can go home. And I was like, seriously, like my my leg looked like ground meat still, you know. And uh, they're like, no, you're fine. Just keep it clean, keep it sterile, whatever. And uh, what were the injuries? What all did you have? So I have uh, I had um, a full thickness, you know, third degree burn to my foot, my calf, my left thigh, and I had second degree burns uh, on my ass and um, up to my my ribs. Wow! Right, and. Um, you know, they sent me home and, you know, they kind of tell my, my wife at the time, like, you're going to have to help them, you know, and poor thing. She's, uh, you know, it's not her jam, you know? And, uh, so she's literally wound cares hard. Like, wound cares it's, hard. It's tough, man. It is. And, and especially if you're not in that field, you're not used to kind of that stuff. And she, she had a hard time with it and uh, I felt bad for her, but she would try to help best she can, you know? And, uh, so I think I was home maybe a week and a half or so. And I woke up like on a Friday, I think it was. and uh, sick as a dog, man, fever, body aches, like just didn't feel, feel well at all. So I called the, the Bamsi and, and told him I had a fever and like, you need to come in. So basically I had an infection, the grafts didn't take. Mm -hmm. And so I had an infection and, uh, so they brought me in, doped me up with a bunch of antibiotics, pain meds. And then I went to surgery. They had to debride everything and take everything back off. Right. Ouch. And, uh, so then the second time I was there, they debrided everything and I had like cadaver skin and all that. Like, um, the cool thing is I didn't know how, I didn't know anything about burns or how they work and how do you recover. Right. They put the cadaver skin so that your cells start trying to connect to the skin. Right. So they have basically they're practicing connecting. Yeah. And then they take the cadaver skin off and put your skin. And then it's like, oh, they've had all this practice to connect to skin. So now it's their skin that they're going to accept. Wow. Because they, they reject the cadaver skin. Right. And then they, uh, so they put your skin on there for these grafts and then the sales quick, and it's supposed to be a pretty quick process for the skin to, to adhere to each other. It seems weird to have it's someone weird, right? else's skin on <laughs> you. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and it's funny because like, I, I was like, who, who's this? this guy? Yeah. You know what I mean? Am I a criminal now? Like, you know, but, uh, um, yeah, so they had this whole, this whole process and, um, you know, it's pretty interesting, but, um. You know, I stayed in the hospital for, I think, another maybe two months, I guess, um, making sure they made sure it, like, it took this time, yeah. you know? And what was that recovery like? Are they coming in? Because I've had some friends that have been burned, and I remember him saying they had to scrape out the the wounds. They'd come in, like, once a week or once a day or whatever and, and had to wash it and scrub yeah. it, and he said it was the worst pain he'd ever felt. Man, I'll I tell you what, the... The, the the burn wound cleaning, when they would do that, and like a, a, they, a nurse would come in and help me, but I, you know, I couldn't take a full shower, right? So they'd come in, or my, my wife at the time would help me, you know, bathe and, and like clean up. And uh, the worst pain that I remember is the graft sites, mm -hmm. where they took the skin from. 
Where did they take so it they, from? So for me, they took it off my thighs. And so how right? does that work? Like you're taking it off my thigh to put it on my foot. Well, what the hell do you put on my thigh to replace the skin you so, took? <laughs> yeah, that's the thing, right? So it's you're like- You're robbing a, Peter to pay Paul. Yeah, so it's like a cheese slicer. It literally takes a thin slice of skin, right? But not full depth. Not so, full depth. Okay. Just like superficial almost, right? Wow. They take this skin and then they put it through a machine and stretch it. That's why they like make holes in it. So they almost triple the size of the piece of skin they take. Wow. Right. And so the healing part from where they take the graph, um, they take an oil and moles gauze, right? And they put it on that site and they staple it to it. And you don't touch it, do you don't clean it, you don't do anything for 10 days. Hmm. Right. And at day 10, they peel it off like a scab. And that's the worst pain ever. Wow. Because they're peeling, literally peeling a scab off you. Yeah. And I was like, of all the technologies and all the advances, I mean, they got fish scales to help rejuvenate skin. Growing ears on mouse Growing backs. Growing ears, yeah, <laughs> on mouse backs, yeah. And you, and you're, the go-to is this, like, it was oh, painful. Man. Like, it was painful. Um, like I said, peeling just this giant scab off your leg. And uh, I, I still thought, like, this is the best you got? I mean, of all the shit that we got going on with medical, like, yeah. but it works, you know, and my skin, it's it, the same. Like I still have, you know, I have like the, the squares, the scar, the squares, you know? Um, but yeah, that was, that was probably the worst part when they would like, I remember biting a towel, covering my face, screaming in pain while they were peeling it off. And I was like, like saying, stop, like stop. And I remember looking at my mom and dad's face, my mom, my mom and dad were in the room the first time uh, that that happened. And, uh, Mom's face is she's just like almost not laughing, but like doing the whole like, like yeah. oh, like that sucks, yeah. <laughs> you know. Um, but yeah, it was that that was pretty. And then and then like the recovery, like again, my foot. Right, I I sat in bed most of the time. They would have me get up, and just getting up itself would take me an hour because you know you have all this nerve damage and all these nerves are trying to rebuild, right? And uh, you know how your foot falls asleep? Mm -hmm. Multiply that by a thousand mm. and then trying to get up from it, right? And it takes that long for like the blood flow to kind of go back, all the nerves. So it would take me, and the pain was excruciating, to sit up and bring my legs over to the side of the bed to get to where I can stand up. It would take me almost an hour, right? Because the pain was just that bad of like I said, of new skin, new cells, new, you know. I'm sure standing up too, you've got oh, it was blood pressure back into your foot. You're standing yeah. on it. It's Yeah, and that was, but once you're up and that goes away, it's like, okay, I can do this. And, you know, they have me walking around uh, the circle of the uh, the floor uh, at, the, at the burn unit. Mm -hmm. And they're like, hey, let's just do one lap. And I do one lap, like, all right, let's do another one. So now I would ask like, hey, let's do one more. Like my mind at the time was recovery. I want to recover, 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 get back on a truck, get back on a truck. And so when they said, Hey, we're going to walk two laps. I'm like, no, let's do four. Let's do let's. I want to go outside. Let's go walk outside. And you know, they're like, you need to slow down. I'm like, no, like I'm good. Like, let's do this. And so I was really working on recovery. And then I get home and I'm going to physical therapy, you know, picking up marbles with my toes and, you know, doing, you know, foot presses and all this stuff. I'm like, Hey, give me more. Like I need more. You know, I want to get back to work. I want to get back to work. And I was more focused on the physical side of it because for me, that was kind of like, I hate to say my identity, but that's who I was. Jimmy, you know, tailboard, fireman, like, let's go do some work kind of thing. And um, so I was, I was really focused on, on getting back to work, the physical side of it, right? And I never really, uh, I never really thought about the mental side of it, right? I was it was more the physical. Let's get back on a rig, and I remember even my uh, we have a staff psychologist, and he was like, "I'm not worried about you right now. I'm worried about you a couple of years from now, right?" And that still kind of resonates a little bit because it's been eight years. I think it's been eight years, yeah, and uh, I'm still affected by it. You know what I mean? Sure. And so, uh, you know, I focused on getting back to work, and so. I get back to work, right? And I'm back on a truck and I'm doing my thing. And Do you and feel like you distracted yourself with the recovery process? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah uh, 100%. Like just- And get, that works for a while, And right? it does. Yeah. Absolutely it does. And so I get back to work and, uh, you know, we'll make a fire here or there. And uh, 
How long did it take you to get back to work? Uh, about six months, seven months. Really? Yeah. Wow. And that's I was focused, like, get back, you know? And uh, when I got back, I hear the box alarm tones for fire. Man, anxiety would go up. My heart yeah, would go was up. That? How'd you react Start, to that? And that's the thing. I would, I would get, like, nauseous on the way, but I would hide it. Like, I wouldn't tell anybody. I wouldn't, you know, say anything. And then I'd get, you know, on the job and... Um, you know, get get to work and then I just forget about it because you get focused on refocusing. Hey, now I got a job, you know. And then uh so again, didn't tell anything, didn't even tell my, you know, my wife at the time, wasn't saying a whole lot. And uh so I was like, let me immerse myself back into back into the job. So I started working overtime, picking up all the overtime I can get because that allowed me to hear the tones multiple times, go on multiple calls, kind of get over that anxiety of hearing the box alarm tones get over that nervousness you know so you were intentionally trying to work to work to try and work through that yeah that response that, that you response, were having yeah that was my that was my thought like let me immerse myself back into it hmm. so that i get over when i hear the tones i don't immediately get anxiety you know did that work it didn't so <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> so yeah no so i uh so that was the thing so I was doing that right, and this one night, I uh, I was I got picked up some overtime, and and one of the captains down South Austin, he p- picked me up on his crew and on a rescue, and uh, it was one of those nights where storms blow through the South South Austin storms, you know, heavy rain, lightning strikes everywhere, and uh, we responded to like five, four or five box alarms that night. And, you know, three legit working fires and, uh, it's a busy night. It was a busy night, but the busiest I've ever, I've never had that night before, yeah. you know, again, I've never had it since. And, uh, like total exhaustion, fire after fire, going to one, going to the, going to another fire. And, uh, we make a fire, at, at this, at this house, two story house. And, um, it's a lightning strike fire in the attic. And I walk up the stairs and, uh, you know, I see the fire, you know? And, uh, you know, we're on the rescue and search, you know, inside truck kind of thing. I get to the top of the stairs on the second floor and, uh, I just, I got real bad anxiety. I got like fear just came over me. Right. And so I hooked my hook into the sheetrock right by the top of the stairs. And so, and I held on to the end of it and I, you know, like I said, I smashed it in the sheetrock. So that was my guide to my, my stairs on the way out. And then I started getting real bad anxiety. I was like, window, window, exit, window, exit. And I didn't do my job of let's pull some ceiling and let's find the fire. And so the engine company come knock, you know, put the fire out. And I caught myself like, that's not safe for everybody else. Right. And I've been hiding how I feel. I haven't told anybody. Just let me do my thing. Again, of course, you know, when I'm home, you know, I'm amped up and, you know, you know, drinking and like sad and quiet, you know, my wife and kid are at work or, you know, my wife's at school or kids at school, wife at work. And I'm like sitting by myself and like, man, like I'm, 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 I'm amped up. I'm, I'm on alert. That's why you stayed working overtime. That's why you stay working. So then I, you know, drink some whiskey. You don't don't have to come back down. Yeah. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, I'd make a cup of coffee, put some whiskey in my coffee kind of thing. And, uh, so that night we get back, you know, finally, you know, four o'clock in the morning or so. And, and I was like, I'm done. Like, I'm done. I got to I got to get off the truck. So uh, the next shift, I called my captain. I told my captain at my station, at station 18. I was like, hey, man, like, I need to get off the truck. Like, I'm not right. And so uh, that was hard to, yeah. to say, you know. <clears throat> and then um, so I, I went to go be a, a, we call them team leaders down at the training academy uh, for new cadet class. So I went to go be a TL. And again, my thought there was, let me reimmerse myself back into the job. You know, these are new cadets, right? They're learning every part of the job from step one to step a thousand, you know? So my uh, my goal was to get down there, reimmerse myself in the training aspect, get away from the truck for a little while, clear my mind, reset, right? Um, and it worked for a minute, right? So I finally get back to the truck and then... Um, you know, same thing. I'm just, I'm still always on alert. I'm always like. Can't turn it off. Can't turn it off. And I get to work. I'm like, it's funny when I get to work though, I would uh, 
almost remove myself. Like the guys come in the kitchen, I went to the living room. Guys are in the kitchen or in the living room, I go to the kitchen or go to the back bedroom and kind of almost hiding. Why do you think you were doing that? I don't I don't know. Even now, like I, I still think about I don't I don't know why I was doing like removing myself. But then when we get a call, I was up. I was ready to go. Let's do this. I I feel like I did my job well. I never got any complaints from officers, you know. And um uh, uh but I was still like almost withdraw, right? Even at home, withdraw, right? And then I was finding ways to like how how do I handle how I feel? Like I didn't, it was hard to talk about it and go talk to my wife like, hey, I feel this way. Do you feel like you're the only one that felt that way? Yeah. You know, and I had some friends like they were combat vets that I would call and be like, hey man, like how do you, how do you make it stop? And they're like, man, it, it'll stop. Like it'll stop, you know? But I find myself, like I said, just drinking, drinking, drinking and, you know, going out doing stupid shit and, you know, fighting with my wife and, uh, drinking, drinking, and then I uh, promoted, and I went to drive uh, uh over at uh down south, and then you know transferred over to uh station eight over off. Do you Point. feel more comfortable as an engineer? Uh, because typically y'all stay with the truck, right? Yeah, and you're you're the supply. Yeah, and so you're not you're not going internal. Did you feel more more at ease there? I did, uh, to a certain extent. And I was, but I was bored with it. Mm. Like, yeah. I didn't like driving. Like a lot of people, are like, oh, I love driving. I, I, I don't mind it, but it's like a, a it's necessary evil to promote, right? Yeah. And so I, I didn't mind. I was at a very good house, busy house, good people, good captain, good lieutenant, good crew, um, and we made a lot of fire. And uh, I was in charge of the engine a lot, and so I was in charge of those fires. And um, I felt like I did a good job. I, but I got that high again. Like those tones go out, and I ramp up amp up and then we go to fire and we do the work and it's like all right man we did a good job you no know, no one got hurt everybody goes home right fire's knocked down and uh but again i started i was drinking i was drinking 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 and uh you know i would get i, would, I mean i'd get blackout drunk and drive home and not remember the hell i just did and then i get home and of course you know causing trouble with, you know, my, my, my wife and I, and. Was um, the alcohol another distraction or oh, the yeah, only absolutely. way you could sleep and kind of turn sleep, it off? Turn it off, uh, get my mind off stuff. And yeah. then of course I go home and I didn't tell her. She, she, I don't think she, she, she never really knew how much I was drinking, I guess. We're good at hiding it. We're good at hiding it. We think we are anyway. <laughs> yeah. 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 And, yeah. uh, so that was, you know, that was the thing. And then finally, you know, like I said, my, the crew that I was with, you know, at station eight, um, you know, my captain was, you know, a good friend was like, Hey man, like in my driver, uh, and Lieutenant there, they noticed, you know, they were like, Hey man, like, are you good? Are you good? And I'm like, yep, I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. Right. Always, always lied about it. You know? Why do you think he did that? Man, I think more of it is because of the, the stigma, right. Of like you having to admit that you're not right, mm -hmm. you know? and you know, I also feel like I, like I wouldn't want to, even if I know that I'm not, like, I don't want to tell the guy who's relying on me that I'm not. And that, right? that's what was about, the point and, I was about to make. Yeah. Yeah. It's hard. It is. Because you're like, I'm Jimmy, right? I, mm -hmm. you know, I, I feel like I, I built a good reputation for myself. I try to give back to the department. I did a lot of training. I helped with a lot of cadet classes. Yeah. Um, I try to give back. I try to do a good job, try to have a good reputation. Yeah. And, you know, I'm the the happy-go-lucky, let's have some fun, let's do some work, like, you know, let's do a good job. And um, to to have to to continue to go to work and be that person, it got exhausting yeah. because that's not how I, who it I was wasn't, anymore. It wasn't real. Yeah, it wasn't real anymore. Yeah. And There's... so, um, yeah, it just, man, like that, it got exhausting. And so, you know. Well, you spend a lot of time with those guys building trust yeah training together absolutely and their trust is it's important like to have the trust of other men and know that you're doing a real uh, like a job that risks your life it, it creates a really strong bond mm -hmm. and so like i wouldn't want to lose their trust if i were honest 
and then worry like, how do I get that back? Yeah. Like, how do I convince him if I tell him now that I'm not okay to believe me later if I am? Yeah. So I'll just lie and I'll get better and it'll, it'll come out in the wash. Yeah. Right? Like, I'll figure it out. Yeah, I'll get out. over it. I'll figure right. it out. I'll figure yeah, it out. They we'll told on. me it goes away. Yeah, it goes away. I yeah, just, yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, uh, you know, my captain was, he's like, hey man, like, it's all good. Like, you're good. You're good. And, uh, you know, I still, still pretended. Like, hey, I'm gonna come to work and do my job. But again, I wasn't working out with the crew. They're playing pickleball, wasn't really into it. You know, I'd sit in the back on my phone, you know, doing whatever. Um, you know, going through divorce, like you know, dealing with that. My daughter's in college at the time and like uh Do you think that this led to your divorce? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, because it goes back to like being open and honest, communicating, right? Mm -hmm. Learn that through counseling, right? <laughs> like I didn't communicate properly. Uh, I didn't communicate those needs. I didn't communicate how I felt, right? Um, I just, I did my own thing. Like I'm fine. Leave me alone. I'm fine. I'm, you know. Just shut off with everything. Shut off, right? And then you go home, you pretend, right? You know, let's go to dinner. Let's hang out, whatever. Oh, everything's fine. Everything's fine. We'll have a date night. That'll fix it. Yeah, yeah, you know, and uh, and eventually just got to where more withdrawal and you know more heading out and getting drunk and you know I got to a point where like at one morning I was you know it's my turn to go to work because on my you know my shift was coming up and I woke up make coffee because I was used to on my off days I'm gonna pour whiskey in my coffee in the morning and I was heading into work and I made a coffee and I pour whiskey I'm like I'm going into work right now like the fuck am I doing? Yeah. You know, dump it out. I'm like, man, like what's like, what's wrong with me? You know, this ain't me, you know, you know, so then, you know, I get divorced and, uh, you know, that's of course, you know, that's a heavy thing, especially when you know you caused it. Right. Um, especially when you know, like, like that's your family and because you couldn't speak up and like, be honest about stuff uh you ruin that right but the way to get over that is to continue to drink drink go out do whatever get your mind off everything else by you know let me go hang out with the guys let me go drinking let me go strip club let me go whatever to get my mind off everything and not face reality right so then uh you know i get divorced and you know start you know trying to date and you know found a, uh, start dating a girl that, that, you know, very similar background, military, firefighter, nurse. And, uh, of course, kind of same thing, you know, just, uh, never really fixed myself. She knew, you know, she would say, she's like, you got, you got problems. You know, With that background, she's probably got her own trauma. Absolutely. She right. She understands yeah. and recognizes that. And, uh, and of course, no, I'm fine. I'm fine. You know, she was, you know, encouraging, like, Hey, you need to, you need to, you need time to go fix yourself kind of thing. And, uh, you know, you need counseling, you need counseling. And that was one of the things like with, with my wife, like, you know, I never really committed to counseling. Like mm -hmm. I was like, I wanted counseling, you know, like whatever. And when we did go to counseling, I felt like I was running the counseling session. And of course it was, it was, uh, you know, you're going, going to, uh, not being open, not being like, Hey, let's, let's work. Let's, talk, fix this, you know, let's do this together kind of thing. It was like, fuck off. I'm gonna go get drunk kind of thing. And, uh, not looking at the big picture of it all. And so, uh, you know, I started a little counseling and then finally, um, my buddy, uh, my buddy Cy was like, Hey man, you should really think about doing this. And he was, you know, his army veteran is Apache pilot. His brother is a, uh, he used to fly for the 160th and like, he's like, Hey man, you should really like, you should really think about this. Like you got some you got some problems, you know, fix your shit. And I was like, no, I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm fine. And, and finally, uh, I talked to, um, uh, Justin Lepre. He's the, uh, kind of the founder of the illuminating, illuminating heroes. Right. And they do the whole, like, uh, it's for veterans, first responders to help with, uh, with PTSD. And, uh, but it's, uh, you know, it's, a, uh, a therapy with psilocybin, you know, the mushroom really therapy. 
What was your what was your impression of that? Like I've talked to some people about it and I usually it's either hell yes or hell no. Like few people are kind of middle ground on it because uh, there's a lot of taboo, right? It is. And so what was your So my initial thought was was whatever. I'll try. If it works, I'll, I don't care. I'll try. Okay. But at first I was real, like I said, initially a little skeptical. Like, I don't know what this is about. I've never done mushrooms, right? i never done psilocybin. I never did anything like that. I, the most I ever did was I, you know, smoked some weed and started some coke in high school kind of thing, right? Yeah. Never really thought, like mushrooms wasn't my thing. Like never really thought about it. Was and, it a uh, in in the U.S.? Was it? Yeah, out? no, it was it was in the U.S. It was uh, under, uh, like I said, the Illuminating Heroes was a church ceremony. Uh, retreat right and so Sai, you know it was like like you need to go you need to look and he would send me podcasts of other other uh you know first responders or, or military members that that would have done it mm -hmm. right and their outcomes you know and so i finally was like fuck it. it i can't get any worse you know what i'm saying like if it helps it helps see what happens and right. so i committed to it and uh what was that retreat like so it was it was, it was a, a three-day thing and uh you know the first day you know well prior to that you have to uh and it's set up right uh, prior to that you speak with the trauma therapist you have a phone conversation make sure you're good to go kind of a good candidate kind of thing and so we did that and then I kind of got approval to show up with people from everywhere you know firefighters military all diverse backgrounds right was there a cost? Uh, very minimal. No, no, very, very minimal. So he it, he's a nonprofit, so he works off donations. And okay. so for us, the cost for him is is a lot, but for me, it cost me five hundred bucks. Nice. And basically, I'll it paid for food and lodging yeah. essentially, right? Um, and so I, on his end, I know it costs a little more than that per yeah. person, you know. And uh, uh, so like he works off donations and and um, you know, to help. And he's done a number of retreats, you know, to help people first responders and military. And I think now um, he's also starting to, to do spouses, you know, to help spouses. Yeah. Because going back to mine, um, my wife at the time got a phone call from the Brackenridge staff. It wasn't from the fire department. It wasn't from a friend. The, the staff, a member called her, the registrar lady and said, hey, your husband's been burned. He's at the hospital. And she left a message. You know, so now like she, for a while there, if uh, a 512 number that was not in her cell phone, would, she would start to get anxiety and kind of panic a little yeah. bit, right? And so I think, you know, like I said, now I think you start to include, you know, family members. She was having trauma every time you went to every work. Time, every time I went to work. Yeah. Right? And so. Um, That's great for the spouses, man. My My marriage has been day and night like we view it before and after having been to a retreat my yeah. wife's been as well mm -hmm. and and that's great i think it, having the spouses having the families come too because they do they're not direct with the trauma but they they you know experience the, their own yeah. through it through the their loved one yeah you know um, and then like like for mine like I put my shit on her mm -hmm. and beat her up with it. A lot of times it's the only people that we have. Yeah. yeah. Even the, like, you know, like the, the, the girl that they I'm, end up getting the worst of the it. one I was seeing, like, yeah. yeah, I, 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 I put it on her, yeah. you know, and, and never fully getting the help that I, you know, that I need. So goes for treat. And, uh, like I said, never having done any sort of hallucinogen ever. Mm hmm. And so the first day, you know, you meet everybody and, and it's, it's a very calm setting and, and we do some, some, uh, breathing meditation and, and breath work and, um, talk about how things are going to go and we have a good meal together. And the breath work for me was, I was like, at first I was like, oh, it's kind of stupid. I'm sitting here breathing to this music. But then I was like, man, like I felt great. Yeah. I felt relaxed. And, uh, and for me, like they said, Hey, after this session, after our breathing little ceremony, breath work i want you to the f word that pops up in your head and write it down right and for me uh <clears throat> the word forgiveness popped up i was like what the fuck does that mean right like write it down I'm, and still i'm still a little like this is some hippie shit right now you know what i mean i do know what you mean <laughs> <laughs> you, know? you know and then we go to this little fire ceremony and they're like you know hey 
this is what we're doing and we want you to take your piece of paper and we want you to throw it in the fire. And again, I'm still like this. Some <laughs> fucking all right. hippies. <laughs> yeah. Let's, let's do this. But I'm like, you know what? I'm in it. Let's yeah. do it. And so uh, the next day we get up in the morning and do our ceremony and, and, you know, we eat our, our heroic dose of, of, uh, how many so, grams so did you have? Uh, I think six grams is a heroic dose. That's right? solid. Yep. And uh, was it actual mushrooms or synthetic psilocybin? Actual. Okay. Yeah. And, and so uh, that was your your first time to first consume time. zero psilocybin. to hundred. Zero to hundred with that. Yeah. What What was that experience <laughs> like for you? Um. It was. It was. It was very difficult. So how did it come on? What did you start to notice first? And then, I mean, you're listening to a playlist, I assume. Did you have an eye mask on? Yeah. So, so they, they put us on a, a little pad and, and they ask you to, you know, if you want to bring a pillow and blanket and I brought a blanket my mom made for me. It's so, uh, God dang, it's, uh, it's all right, man. They put the mask on and yeah, headphones, they got music playing. Yeah. And, and I think the idea is, well, the idea is you need to get inside your head, mm. get inside your brain figure that shit out right yeah and so um when it first started coming on like i i felt uh the tingling right this energy energy right? yeah and then the breathing i started breathing like heavy and then a little nausea not a whole lot and that's what i was scared of because like i don't want to throw up yep right <laughs> yep <laughs> so, so uh a little <laughs> nausea and then you know and then i i was like okay i i gotta settle in and then uh man i was I felt the breathing, I felt it, and then uh, really trying to, you know, figure out what I'm feeling, what it is. Like, like I said, I've never done it before. Like, what, what is this, you know? And then uh, I, I felt this, like, rush of, like, I feel great. I have no pain. Uh, my body feels great. I felt just... I felt amazing. Like I felt great, but I was nervous. I was scared. Didn't know where I like. I kept checking if I was safe. Like I'd take my eye, my mask off, and like, who's that? Who's that? Who's that? Am I safe? Where am I? Right. Mm -hmm. And uh, at one point, I remove my mask and I look up, and we're in a room. There's ten of us, and I'm looking around, and I see a guy crossing me on a knee, staring at me, twirling his pin. And I remember going, that guy's going to kill me. And then I see another guy with his head kind of twisted, his cockeyed, and he's looking up at the ceiling. And I look over and the guy next to me that I started with was gone. And then I, there was a girl a couple mats down and she's got like her blanket lawn like a hoodie and she's staring at me smiling. And then I see another guy sitting on a pillow and he's like, has these headphones on and he's twirling around on his pillow and and that moment i was like i fucked up <laughs> i'm in a loony bin and i'm never leaving you know yeah <laughs> so uh and so then I, I i got up i was like let me let me get up and go to the restroom so i got up and went to the restroom and uh, i was walking i i don't i don't think i was walking bad i felt like i was walking fine but i i went to to take a leak and i'm taking a leak and the bubbles from my pee were just like blah, 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 blah. and so i was like oh my god like the pee bubbles the they pee got bubbles. me too <laughs> <laughs> i'm just watching this kaleidoscope of pee bubbles yeah, this is yeah. amazing and so uh and a mushroom shrinks your dick too really like i i, I felt like that. i did yeah, like funny i don't have a lot to, to begin with but it was just like where to go <laughs> so um but uh so I'm I'm in this restroom and it's a big beautiful house where we're at this retreat on on the lake and big bay windows and I wash my hands and I wash my face and I'm pacing and I'm breathing and there's a guy Mike there he's a good friend uh he's like hey you okay and I was like no like I need you to make it stop I was like I want you to make this stop and in my mind the medicine side I'm like there's a rescue med you can make this stop You're right where's the narcan where's the narcan yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, I'm pacing back and forth and I'm breathing and I feel good, but I'm also scared because mm -hmm. it's too intense. Mm. I've never had that feeling before. It is intense. Yeah. Very intense. And uh, so I was like, you make this stop. Like, I, I need to stop. I'm done. And another guy comes in. We had, there's a, a medic guy that, you know, they help facilitate these things. And uh, he was like, hey, brother, just accept it. 
breathe, accept it. And I was like, oh, I'll make it stop. Like I started to get kind of pissed, like make it fuck stop. I, I'm done. Like I want, I'm done. And they were like, you, and you know, Mike was like, hey man, accept it. Breathe, accept it. Let's go sit down, get some water, accept it. And so I was like, you have to have something to make this stop. And then the other guy was like, here's some peppermint oil, smell this. And he puts it on my nose. And at the time I was like, oh yeah, this works, right? And then later on, I was like, that motherfucker. The placebo like, <laughs> as fuck. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And so I go I double sit down. your left shoe. It'll go away <laughs> it's, it's fine, yeah. <laughs> and so I'm sitting there and again, I'm like, all right, let's do this. Like, I'm going to accept this. And then uh, and I put my mask back on. I grab my blanket and, you know, they have it nice and cool and comfortable for us. And uh, And then I started to really just, okay like breathing and I was fine. And, and, uh, then I, I, of course, you know, got in my head and I'm, I'm looking at myself as a little kid laying in my bedroom upstairs in my parents' house. And I'm watching myself, the windows, excuse me, in my room that I used to sleep in the smell of my bedroom. My parents had an old house that, you know, just kind of smell old, the feel of the blanket that I used to have. And watching myself laying in bed, crying. And uh, I was like, fuck. Like, what is that? Right? Of course, you start to say, what is that? What does that mean? You know? And then uh, I go over, for whatever reason, I'm like, man, like, I I smell my home. Like, you know, the home I grew up in. Uh, The windows. Like, everything is like, I'm there. And then, uh, uh, you know, I'm like, oh, shit, you know. And then uh, the next thing I smell is like the the current home that, you know, I used to live in with my, my wife and kid. And uh, um, I see her. I smell my bedroom, the house, the blankets that, you know, the comforter and all that shit we had on our bed. And I see her uh, crying, laying there and... Uh, and I'm over her and I see it again. I smell it. The windows, the, 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 the curtains, everything we had, it was like I was in there. And then I felt pain. Like I felt like this pain, like enter me and I felt her pain. Right. And then it was like, bam, I'm in my daughter's room. Same thing. She's laying in bed crying. And I, again, the exact way her room was set up, even the damn dog Rico uh in her room and uh i feel i feel her pain and i'm like god like this sucks like how do you like how do you explain that right so then i'm like this is too much again take my headphones or the headphones off and get up and go to the restroom again and and they're like hey man like like you're good you know so then i'll go back and sit down well I'm in the restroom and I'm again, I'm pacing and they're like, Hey, you got like, you need to go like somebody else needs to use the restroom kind of thing and trying to get me to go back. Right. And I was like, make it stop, man. Like again, make it stop. And then as I'm walking back, I heard one of the guys go, they got four hours left. <laughs> oh, <shit. laughs> and, and I lost much. I was like four hours, four hours. <laughs> <laughs> oh man um yeah there ain't no off button there's man. no it's off just button through bro. no mm. and so uh so then i went and, and that freaked me out a little bit you know yeah. and that that you know kind of got me going again i'm like sitting there like am i safe where am i who am i with what's going on like am i in a nut house now for the rest of my life is this my life kind of thing and uh of course you know i go sit back down and uh you know Put my headphones back on, put my, eye, you know, coverings on and get my blanket. And then I really try to sit in it again. And finally I, I got comfortable with it. And, you know, the happy, all the, the happy I've ever felt, all the sad I've ever felt, all the pain I've ever felt, um, just amplified by a thousand, you know. I remember at one point I started, like I felt myself crying and breathing like a hundred miles an hour. But everything was bright orange, kind of like back at Dry Creek. Um, I was laying in a position to where, like, I was at the hospital. And um, 
just breathing 100 miles an hour, man, and crying, like uncontrollably crying. And I felt someone patting my chest. And, you know, there's people who help facilitate. And, yeah. and I remember asking myself or saying to myself, like, damn, like, why am I such a pussy right now? Like, why am I crying? Why am I such a pussy? And then a small voice I hear from the distance go, Jimmy, you're not a pussy. And I was like, what was that? Right? It was one of the the people that helped facilitating. <laughs> they were speaking out loud because I was speaking out loud. Yeah. And I heard that. So it became a joke at, you know, the next couple of days. Like, Jimmy, you're not a pussy, you know? But, um, and I sat in those feelings and I sat in, you know, with the medicine and, um, you know, and then you come out and they give you a, uh, you know, a nice bowl of fruit was again, probably the best fruit I ever best ate. Thing the best ever thing ever. My, like, my brain starving for yeah. sugar, you know yeah. what I mean? Best fruit ever. Best. And the water was so, it was regular old tap water, but it was nice and cold and refreshing. Like it was the best. It's an ass kicker. I don't know how it you, is. Like I felt like I had. I was been, drained. Ran a marathon. Yeah. Yeah. Fucking sore. I never run a marathon. Day. I'm fat. So. I never have either. Yeah. But I, what I imagine it would feel like. I yeah. fucking hate running. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so, uh, um, man, amazing. Like I said, fruit was amazing. And um, uh, I really sat with it. And then, you know, the next day we we do the um, uh, MAO5. The 5 MAO. 5 MAO, yeah. DMT. Sounds very, I mean, almost identical to what I've done yeah. here in Austin. It's, and so, um, that that really kind of set me off a little bit. I when I did that the next morning, beautiful day out, sun was out, nice and cool day. What was your mindset after after the psilocybin? I mean, you, you struggled with it, but then you got comfortable. I got comfortable. Were you also nervous with the five, or were you like, I feel good with it now? What else you got? I felt good with it now, wow. but I was still. I think after like you come out. And you know you you get your fruit and you and they let you. It go takes to, time to come. It back takes down. time. Like you're, it's not like ding. Oh, I'm good. Like, no, they want you. You know, <laughs> they say, hey, go journal. Go, you know. Yeah. And while you're in it, they want you to journal too. The funny story, I'm not much of a journal. I'm not much of a writer. Me but, either. Um, I tried to journal, but the one thing I did do was uh, I drew a picture of our dog Rico, my daughter's dog. He's a little Chihuahua. The way my daughter drew him when she was when she first got him. Kind of like a circle with pointy ears and toothpicks, you know? Yeah, yeah. And uh, I still remember, like, I drew it exactly how she used to draw him when she was a kid, you know? But anyway. It's where she got her artistic ability. Yeah, it was yeah, from you. <laughs> yeah. But, um, you know, sitting in it, and then, like I said, when you come out of it, for me, I, I didn't know what to think. Like, Did you feel different when the psilocybin wore off? I did. I felt relief, mm. right? I felt like... You know how I can like arrange you do do a uh, uh, do a hump with, you know, sixty seventy pounds of shit on your back, and you're hiking through Camp Pendleton, and you take that pack off at the end, you're like, "Fuck, feel light, feel light." Yeah. I felt relieved. I, I felt light. In my the, one of the ways that I've described it to people is, it feels like baptism is described. Yeah, like That's I was it, yeah. new. I like everything was washed away from me. Yeah. So I felt I I felt that to a certain extent, yeah. right? And then uh, you know, the next day um, we do that, and for that it doesn't last that long, you know, twenty minutes or whatever it was. Oh, the five. The five. Yeah. What was your five experience like? Uh, so, so like I said, beautiful day. Do that, smoke it, and it was immediate. I was back at uh, back at the hospital, right? When I was in the hospital, and you're seeing it, or you're I'm feeling see it? I'm seeing it. Wow. Um. And when I was at the hospital, my window faced a wall, a brick wall. And so at night, you know, when I'm alone, everybody's gone, visiting hours, whatever, I would literally count the bricks on the wall. And that's because that's all I saw. So I would sit there and count the bricks till I fell asleep. And uh, so I was back at the hospital, same smell, uh, laying in a position that I was with my leg up. And uh, everything was bright orange, just heat. I felt the heat on my back and I kept smacking at my neck because I kept feeling this heat on my back like I felt, you know, in Dry Creek at the fire. Um, but I was still looking at through the window with the blinds, counting bricks, you know? And then, uh, of course, I start crying uncontrollably, like just uncontrollable crying. Like, 
again, I'm thinking to myself like, damn, why am I such a pussy right now? Like I'm fucking crying. I won't fucking stop. So I get up and walk and, uh, you know, there's, you know, people helping you and, um, and I'm walking around and, and I cannot stop crying. And, uh, finally when I did, I gathered myself again, I felt light. I felt like, okay. Like I felt great. Right. You know, we go back, we make jokes and we talk and whatever. Um, but, uh, um, you know, then the next day we morning, wake up, we do a little, you know, session, a counseling session, you have to talk. And then the follow up to this retreat is about six weeks of group therapy, you know, zoom meetings and talking and you, oh, accountability wow. checking. Yeah, right? wow. And you, you have to message every day. How'd you, you know, what, what do you got going? How you feeling kind of thing? And it was a group session, right? And there was a leader, Mike, that was our kind of our group, like checking in on, make sure everybody's checking in every day or at least every other day making sure everybody's still good and you know if they have any issue and, and we would get on a little zoom and everybody kind of talk talk through whatever issue they're having right and for me one of the things one of the things i that i had the uh issue was um some of the guys would talk about like they had these aha moments like afterward like man i feel forgiven i feel relief i feel great i can't wait to move on and for me i didn't have that hmm. and so i started to get kind of like like what was my journey? You know why? Like why don't I have that moment? I although I felt some relief, and for me, I think the biggest thing was going back to forgiveness. I forgave myself for the shit that I did, right? But I still didn't have that aha moment, you know, mm. that everybody else was having, and so uh, I struggled with that quite a bit. Like, what's wrong with me? That can be a big problem with these group events in in someone that has a breakthrough moment like yeah. that makes others question their yeah. experience if they didn't mm -hmm. uh and that that can actually cause cause some problems and we we talked about it in the retreats that that we did and I, you know try not to you don't because you don't want to affect someone whatever yeah. that was if you were content with what you had and then you find out that somebody else had something crazy and you're like well, why the fuck didn't i have that <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> you know yeah and then for me it, it took me a while it, it took me a little while to figure out what my journey was mm -hmm. and my journey was is is even still i still think about it is is the forgiveness and a lot of it's forgiving myself and um uh what do you feel like you had to forgive yourself for just the way, uh, you know, the way I ended things with, you know, friends and my ex-wife, mm. you know, and the, and the, what my daughter had to go through, you know, uh, putting them through, especially my, my, my wife at the time and my daughter, putting them through what they had to go through when I got hurt. Mm. I never, I never considered their feelings. Does that make sense? Yeah. Right. <clears throat> I never considered, I never, I never, I never did. It was at the time the focus was get better, get back to work. Right. I never, not once considered them. And, uh, when I think about it, like that's shitty of me as their dad, as their provider, as their protector, like. I should have taken the time to check in. Hmm. You know what I mean? I do. Uh, and so that, that's, you know, still work, you know, still working kind of on that through that kind of thing. Um, but then for me, also the forgiveness is, is like slow down, like for, like you don't have to work so much. You don't have to grind and like hustle so much. To prove. Nothing to prove. I have nothing to prove. Yeah. And that's what I did. Yeah. That's a very good point. I had nothing to prove anymore. I don't like the whole ego drop. Like, if you don't like me, okay. I understand everybody has different. And that was the one thing I got perspective. I never looked at other people's perspective. It was always mine. Right. And to, to open myself up to everybody has their story. Everybody has their journey. Everybody has their perspective. Um, and that's one thing that I, I'm trying to continue to, to do, you know, even now, like, you know, I, I, I see a therapist not as often as I should, but, you know, I talk about how I, I let go of that ego, you know, mm -hmm. and, uh, 
I'm just, I'm a little more, I'm a lot more calmer these days. I don't feel like I need to prove myself. I don't feel like I have to hustle. I don't feel like I have to be Jimmy, you know, at the firehouse, you know, happy go lucky. Let's have a good time. Let's do some work. Um, I don't feel like that anymore. And, and I'm okay with that. And before I'd be like, nope, I'm Jimmy. I'm going to go to work. I'm going to work at the busiest houses in the city. I'm going to put in work. I'm going to do shit. I'm going to give back. And now it's like, you know, I'm going to do me. Because in the end, you know, and, I, and I, I'm not trying to sound negative. Nobody gives a shit. You know what I mean? Yeah. Nobody cares. And, uh, you know, one of the things I noticed too, that that even after and after divorce, my, my you know, my friend group got smaller. And, uh, and I'm okay with it. You know what I mean? Quality over quantity. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, man. And so, uh, so yeah, man, just try to refocus and, and, uh, shit happens and move on. So that's kind of where I'm at. <laughs> so, that's awesome, dude. That's yeah. a hell of a journey. Yeah. And I'm like I said, I'm still working on that journey, like accepting where I'm at in life, mm -hmm. you know, who I've hurt, you know, uh, hopefully they forgive, you know, um, did you have a conversation with your ex after the retreat? I have not. No. I have not at Does all. Does she know that you went to do that? I told my daughter, but I don't, and I don't think at the time, I, even my daughter, I don't think she fully understand, understood what I was, what it was, yeah. you know? Uh, she's 23 now, but like, I've kind of, I haven't told her everything. Like, if she hears this, is the first time she's ever going to hear it. Yeah. You know? um, so, I haven't, and it's probably something I should do. You know how it goes. <laughs> so it's, it's hard. It's they're, hard. They're hard it's conversations hard, yeah. to have. And the medicine has a, a really crazy ability to to open you up and yeah. to to just all the shit that you've suppressed and yeah. stuffed in the box. It says, nope. Nope. You're that shit's it's you're gonna, coming out. You're going right? to word vomit. Yeah. I had a buddy that was like, you know, I've talked to him about, you know, my journey and, 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 and that, and, and he knows, you know, I went through a divorce and all that. And, and he was like, Hey man, like, what is this? You know, what is this? What is this? How, how can this help me? And, and I told him like, man, try it, you know, try half a gram of mushroom or psilocybin and, and have a conversation. He's like, you know, me and my wife kind of have some issue. Like, you know, figure some shit out. And I was like, put in the work, dude, try it and have a conversation. And, um, uh, I had a little bit, gave him some psilocybin one day and, microdosing and he went home and his wife ate him had a very productive conversation you know and still still going That's you know awesome. what i mean and the pro the, the the thing with that is is that i've learned too is it's a, everything goes back to communication you know how do you communicate how do you open up and that's been a big deal like you know you give someone, you know, half a gram or a gram of psilocybin, they're going to tell you their how they really feel, yeah. and that's important, you know. And that's one thing I did learn from that is, and then putting in work, you know. I wish, well, I don't wish, you know. I see a therapist, and I, I probably should see her more, like I said earlier, more than, uh, more often than I do. And what do you feel the therapy's doing separate from the psilocybin uh, perspective? You know, you get that, you get that, that third person who has no fight in the game yeah. who's going to tell you the truth yeah. and he's going to, they're going to tell you like, Hey, you're being dumb or no, you're being manipulated or you're being this or that, or, you know, um, and then the thing with that is, is it's a, it's a person that again, has no fight in the game. So you can tell them everything, you tell them, you be honest with them, you know, Hey, I feel this way and whatever, and I don't like this. And, you know, they'll tell you their you know, their thoughts. And again, not every therapist is going to be the best for you, but if you find one that works for you, you yeah. know what I mean? Um, and so, uh, that's what I gained from it is, is perspective. And that's one of the biggest things that I'd never had before is perspective. Yeah. Um, you know, everybody has their journey, everybody has their thing and who am I to judge? You know what I'm saying? I do. So I do. David Eaton is a guest I've had on and he was my therapist, Our, yeah. my fam, my wife and I's couples therapist. Yeah. And like the psilocybin kind of, at least for me, I felt like it, it really opened me up and cleaned it all out. And then having someone like David to talk to helped me figure out a plan for, for what yeah. to do then. Yeah. And 
how to communicate. Like I, I want to now, yeah. but I don't totally know how with my spouse yeah. and, and to work. The, and most of our issues were just parenting. Yeah. <laughs> like work. Well, kid, yeah. Our kids kid. are tough. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> He's a honey yeah. badger, man. And, yeah. and I don't know what I'm doing. I've never been a dad before. Yeah. You know, I'm winging it. And the only example I know is, is the, the dad that I had. And he wasn't real open with, yeah. you know, it was, he was, he disciplined. That's, yeah. You know, and that was what I knew how to do. And I realized I had no connection with my kid yeah. because I was just the hammer. That's it. And I didn't want to be the hammer, but he's a fucking maniac. And yeah. so that was just the only way I knew to handle it. And it's completely dissolved that. Yeah. And, and I feel finally like I have a connection with my kid. And, yeah. and he's six, and so I still have time. Oh, you got a lot of time, yeah. But and another fast, one on the way. Yeah. I know. I know my my ex, she was the hammer. Boy, yeah. she she hammered. Yeah. I was the, like, hey, let's, let's go get some ice cream. <laughs> you know? <laughs> well, you're at the firehouse, right? <laughs> yeah. 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 She. It was funny. One day, uh, I still remember my buddy came over to borrow something, and, and I was standing outside. He's like, why are you outside? I was like, mm -mm, I'm not going in there. <laughs> and uh, my daughter had... Uh, I don't remember if she, she stuck her tongue at my ex or said something like mouthed off to her. And I remember she was, she grabbed a belt and my daughter, I think was 13, 12. Mm -hmm. And that was the first real time, like she's about to get it. And so I went outside and my buddy's like, what are you doing? And all of a sudden we hear whack, whack, whack. Don't you ever talk to me that way or whatever it was. And, uh, yeah. My buddy's like, uh, damn, I'm leaving. Like, <laughs> take she, me, take, yeah. take me with you. Yeah, she, uh, she, she was the <coughs> hammer. There, I was the easy one. So, having having been through what you've been through, mm -hmm. and and seeing, learning what you maybe wish you had known. Yeah, what advice would you give to guys that are walking that same path? They've had a traumatic event. Or they have just find themselves spiraling and don't know why. And I mean, maybe it wasn't a serious, like as, as what happened to you, you know, a major injury, but you found your way through it and you've navigated to the other end of a phase that some people don't survive. Yeah. What, what advice to the, the firemen, the veterans, the anybody that's listening, that's seeing things spiral, yeah. uh, how do you... What do you tell them? Man, I I think the 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 advice that I would give is is uh is communicate. Talk talk it out. Right? Find find that person that uh you know, your friend, your buddy, whatever that you can talk it out and find those other avenues of coping mechanisms, right? For me, I was drinking. I was drinking a lot. Is like, that helpful or the uh the alcohol not at all <laughs> no it, that it, yeah that made everything way worse yeah. you know um just man finding that person that you can communicate to and and get it all out you know having that friend that is not going to judge you they're going to be you know objective and they're going to tell you you're fucking wrong you know and uh you know i, I have a couple friends one you know my buddy jeremy he's i call him and he's like hey dude cut your shit out or whatever you know yeah and uh having that is the and and a lot of men like you know we hold it in and that's the biggest thing is is get it out get it out you're not a pussy yeah you know yeah. it doesn't make you a pussy you know but a lot of us uh still have that stigma that if i say how i feel i'm a pussy you know sure and uh and that's not the case you know and I said the the biggest thing I think is just fucking talk about it and get it out and communicate. And if you're married, fucking talk to your spouse. Like, sit them down and forcefully say, "Hey, this is how the fuck I'm feeling." Like, don't dismiss me, kind of thing. You know, let's let's figure this out together. And even like you know, girlfriend, same thing. Like, you know, I, I like I said, I, I mentioned earlier, she she was like, "Hey, you 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 got fucking issues. You need to fix that shit." And of course, I put it on her and. Of course, we're not together, like all that kind of stuff. And, um, but she was a big advocate and I don't blame her. Like yeah. she bounced because the way I was, you know, you weren't, you didn't have enough bandwidth for anyone else at the time. No, not at all. Yeah. And even now I still struggle with yeah. it, you know, 
Um, I feel like it's it's almost a narcissistic delusion that I know I had that I could pursue the most dangerous lines of work and never be affected by it. Yeah. Like I wanted to see the worst fucking thing and prove that it wouldn't affect me. Yeah. That was the dumbest fucking idea yeah. Yeah. that I ever could have had. It's going to affect you. Yeah. And it did affect me. And I, you know, I, my ego wouldn't allow me to believe that I was having an issue with that until it built up to such a point that I had no more ability to contain it. Your glass is full, dude. That's it was exactly full as what fuck. happens. Yeah. And I, I was, I was that jerk that, you know, as an asshole, like we make a medical call, right? In the fire department, we do a lot of medical calls. And if it was a 20 something, you know, 18 year old female and you ask the question, hey, you got any medical history, any issues? Well, I have PTSD. And so my asshole at the time was, oh, you're a combat vet? Because in my mind, the only person that people that were allowed to have PTSD were combat vets. Right. Like that was my thought. Right. And now I'm older, I've got shit going on. It's it's perspective, man. Their, their issues is their issue. And yeah. that's their combat. Yeah. You know what I mean? Sure. And, and I was that asshole that would, like I whatever, but now I'm like, fuck. my trauma is worse my, than your yeah, trauma. Yeah, pussy. Yeah, pussy. But now I, I get it. You know, I I get it. it. People have everybody has their journey. Everybody has their issue. Everybody has their perspective. And that was something that you know maybe it came with age. I don't know. Right. I'm a little older now, but um, I never had that before. And now like, I, I would I would never say anybody. I wouldn't. I would never tell anybody that anymore. Like they have PTSD. I'm like oh fuck, that's their that's their fight yeah you know i can't judge them for that so so yeah yeah man it's a trip thanks but. for sharing man you've this has been yeah very open and honest and i i really appreciate it of course dude um like i said you know like i said the conversation we had before of, of always trying to get back and and uh you know if someone can learn and again gain perspective you know everybody feels their own way and if somebody hears this and they say like man like I, I feel that way too let me fix my shit you know is there any contact for that retreat that you would can uh get? yeah it's uh illuminating heroes um uh it's like i said it's a non-profit um they have a website they or? have a website yeah okay yeah awesome. um and the 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 founder is justin lapree he's a former marine combat vet really yeah yeah. I'd like to get his information yeah, as sure. well. I have people all the time yeah. reach out and and most of the retreats have a schedule. Mm -hmm. And so it's well, they have one, you know, in two months. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes that's too far too long. Yeah, his 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 he's the same. He I think his goal, the last conversation I had with him was was trying to do like one a month kind of thing. And, okay. But of course it all goes to funding and sure you know, cost and sure. Um and so uh, uh I mean he's been he's done a pretty good job. That's awesome so far. So and he's got a good team, you know, um, that helps out. But, um, but yeah, man, it, like I said, I, I appreciate you having me. Uh, um, you know, like my goal again is, is get it out. Whoever could benefit from hearing my shit. You know, I'm not the only one that's been through shit. And Absolutely, man. That's done not the best in life, some aspects of life, you know. <laughs> so, We're all stumbling our way through Yeah, it. <laughs> yeah. Let's tell me before we stop. Uh, tell me about the Central Texas Burn Fund. So the Central Texas Burn Fund is a uh, it's a group of firefighters he here in Austin that we created uh, against a, a non nonprofit that we uh, you know we accept funds. We try to raise funds for uh, a teen uh, burn camp, right? So I also do a part of uh, the Texas Burn Survivor Society. We do a uh, we help out at pediatric burn camp at Camp David in Kerrville, Texas, right? Okay. And as you know, all all privately funded, donation funded, and we have kids from five to fifteen you know, that that come to these camps, and um, and the, it's a week long overnight camp, uh, totally free for the fa you know even if they have siblings, the siblings are allowed to attend as well. Oh wow! And uh, so with the the Central Texas Burn Fund on top of the the Texas Burn Survivor Society, we do those kids they age out at 15, 15, 16 years old, right? And so a lot of them, what's happening is they grow up with like kids who are burn survivors and they turn 15 and we send them out to the wind and they never see their friends again. They don't have right? a support group. Either. Yeah. And so uh, we created our Sarah, um, 
Kuhn, she's kind of our president. Uh, the, the Camp Axe, main, named after a gentleman named Axe Dillard, who's a retired Austin fireman that, that was burned on the job saving a, another firefighter back in, you know, a, few, a, lot, a lot of years ago. And so we created that to um, help uh, the kids after they age out of Camp David, we do a team camp, Camp Axe, so they can still come to Austin and show them around town. And again, a lot of them are low income families. And, and so it's a, it's a, a fully funded trip for them. And um, so as they get older from 15 to 21, 16 to 21 years old, they can see their friends still. So, That's awesome. and a lot of them, you know, they go to college. Some of them got married, you know, that, um, and, uh, so it gives an opportunity to come back around and see their friends again. So that's good. Are these kids, do they struggle making friends outside of the camps? No, some, no, I think the biggest thing for them, uh, a lot of them don't, I, I don't feel that way, but a lot of them. So just help to see someone else. Yeah. So like, say for example, you know, they have burns in their body and they're, you know, say their chest and back or whatever. Right. And they go to a, a public facility, a public pool, and people are going to stare at them and judge them and, and look at them ugly. Like we've had, we, you know, we'll, we'll go to the drag and take them to lunch or something. And, and we'll have a group of, you know, 10 or 15 burn survivors who have severe burns. And you see people look at them like, like they're monsters. Yeah. You know what I mean? And so they get to come to camp and they're not judged. So they want to take their shirt off and jump in the pool versus wearing a full bodysuit, you know, to get in the pool when they're at home, you know, or like, the, you know, some of the girls, we have a dance night um, and they'll wear like a sleeveless dress versus, you know, a full, full sleeved outfit that they're covering up because they don't, they don't want to get stared at. So they come to camp, they can be comfortable in their own skin and, and without judgment. That's so, special. Yeah. That's yeah. cool. And the other, you know, for me again, why I go to, why I help with these camps, it, it, it's perspective for me as well. I went to, I was fortunate enough to, to be a part of these camps. And, you know, after my accident, you know, I feel sorry for myself, like, oh, poor pity me. And then I go see these kids are severely burned, missing limbs. It's like, what the hell am I crying about? Yeah. You know, this kid's is happy, not knowing any different way of life, but they're happy. What the hell am I crying about? You know, mm -hmm. I went to an international burn camp in uh, in DC and same thing. It's like these kids are severely burned and that's their life, but they're happy. It's like, why am I crying about my shit? You know? I do. So, um, so it's fun. It, it's a good, like, you know, this week, Monday, we start the, the pediatric camp again out really? in Kerrville. And so I'll head out there on Sunday and, nice. and, uh, ch help check them in and all that. So it's a week long camp. So awesome. Yeah, man. So that's a great way to give back. Yeah, I try. You know, I'm not the, uh, we laugh their group. You know, there's a, a few of us, uh, Sarah, Frank, Courtney, and Daryl, and, and myself, we, uh, they're like, we have like these, we make this board membership, right? We're the board. And they always ask, like, Jimmy, what do you, what do you do? I'm like, I'm on the board, you know? No, but what do you do? I'm on the board. <laughs> so That's awesome. They make it happen. So, well, it's probably, it's also the best thing that you can do with the trauma. Yeah is find a positive direction to put it yeah. so that you're not drinking and you're yeah. not doing something that's self-destructive. You put that into something that's productive yeah. And, yeah. and helps others and and it does, it makes you feel good. It does, especially the kids, man. I mean, I love kids. I've yeah. always loved kids. And, yeah. and so to see them, you know, how happy they are when they come to camp. You know, of course, like kids, there's always some that are jerks, but sure. they're still happy, you know, and they, they, get, to, they get to have a good time. That's so, awesome. Yeah, man. Cool, man. So. Well, thank you. Thank you for Yeah, of course. So, that's it. Appreciate it. Yeah, of course. Stay zero.